Um, and eventually shrinking down, right? So, so I argued last time that you can have this starting ellipse, uh, uh, which is going to have a diameter, is going to be upper bound by L, where this is sort of the uh, t two to the number of bits uh, uh, in the answer, right? We we, uh, we showed very early on that you only need a polynomial number of bits in order to represent the answer to your linear program. Um, and so there's some sort of maximum number that's relevant. And if you make your ellipse bigger than that, you're fine. Um, that means that the starting volume um, is um, uh, like L to the n power or so, right? Um, and so then. Uh, I claimed that uh, for similar reasons, uh, your ending volume uh, of your polytope has to be greater than two to, than, than uh, one over L, so to speak. Right? You can't make numbers really small in the linear program. So if there's a feasible point, um, uh, if, there, if there's a feasible polytope, it has to. Uh, occupy a, a reasonable amount of, uh, sorry, there should be an n in there. Um, it has to occupy a reasonable amount of space. Um, so the number of iterations that you need um, to get from you know, L to the n power in volume down to 1 minus 1 over L uh, to the n in volume is um, around L, uh, n log of L to the n. Um, uh, or n squared log l, which is polynomial. Yes? What if the polytope only has a single Yes, so that's exactly. The reason that I have re reminded you of these facts is that I swept a few things under the rug uh, last time that I now wanted to bring out from under the rug. And um, uh, probably the most important of them is this question. Um, I argued that the, that the volume of the polytope um, has some lower bound. Uh, but we've seen plenty of examples where the volume of the polytope is zero, uh, even though there's a feasible set, right? So if you think about any standard form linear program, uh, it defines the feasible set as being in a subspace. And so it has volume zero under the sort of standard definition of, uh, of volume. So what do we do about that? Well, um, there's this trick uh, to take any uh, in, in the worst case, there might be only a single feasible point for your linear program. Uh, and actually, this is going to arise, this is quite likely to arise if you do this combined primal and dual trick that we, that we discussed, right? If there's a unique optimum and you combine the primal and dual, then there's going to be exactly one point uh, in the solution to the primal and dual uh, taken together. So what do we do? Well, we need a trick that will take a polytope that is defining a single point and turn it into a polytope that's full dimensional. So how do we do that? Um, so the full volume trick is basically to take your uh, LP, which has the form uh, AX less than or equal to B. And I'm only going to sketch this. Um, and you write it instead as a polytope of the form AX less than or equal to B plus epsilon for a tiny epsilon. Uh, epsilon is going to be about 1 over uh, 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 L or 2L or something like that. OK. So um, why, why is this uh, going to improve things? Well, if you think about it, um, I had some constraint. or I, uh, the, the, My polytope was maybe defining an intersection of many different constraints. And now I'm saying, let's loosen all these constraints up a little bit. So we'll, you know, instead of having them all intersecting at the same place, uh, they'll all be pushed apart a little bit uh, by this epsilon distance that they've moved. Uh, and so what was originally a single point now spreads out to be a uh, larger and full dimensional area. Now, what could go wrong if I do this? Yeah? Uh, well, I'm actually relaxing. So uh, th this is why I said I'm sketching. So uh, I think I'm thinking of this as sort of um, uh, upper bound type constraints. And so what I'm doing here is loosening all of them. 
Okay. So the actually what I should say probably what's probably a better way to say this is um, I'm going to turn the constraints into this. Okay. So I'm, I'm making a little I'm making some room around every constraint. Okay. But there's still a potential problem here. Yeah. You can take an infeasible problem and make it feasible. Exactly. This can turn an infeasible problem feasible, right? It could be that these that the, the intersection of all of these that these hyperplanes left the empty set in their intersection, and when I spread things out like this, um, all of a sudden I get a non-empty set. So I have a feasible problem where I previously didn't. Um, the the key to observe is that um, because we're taking such a small epsilon. Um, the only places where we can kind of produce some feasible points, if there weren't any, um, are at points that are, whose precision is too high for the original linear program that we, um, that we created. So um, you'll get a point, but it, won't, it, 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 it will not be possible for it to be um, uh, fr from the original LP, and so you, you won't be tricked. Um, you can then round, if, if, if you do get one of these points that is in the relaxed linear program, but uh, you want one that's in your original linear program, remember the kind of rounding tricks that we did when we were proving that every vertex is an extreme point and such. We said that if you're in the interior of the polytope, then we, you can move until you hit a boundary and keep doing that until you get to a vertex. So you need to apply those sorts of rounding tricks where you, you, you sort of have this solution. It, you're kind of rounding in the dual in this case because you have a solution that's nearly obeying all of the constraints. And so you just need to slide it over until it obeys all of the constraints. And the arguments get quite technical, um, but you can prove that if you work with this slightly larger linear program, then you can a slightly larger polytope, then you can do that rounding. Um, but that takes like several several weeks of lectures to kind of get through all of the details of the ellipsoid algorithm. So I want to leave you with the uh, sort of key insight about just the fact that you can do this volume reduction and that really cool thing that I showed you last time that you don't actually need to have the constraints given to you explicitly because all you need is a separation oracle. All you need is something that will tell you which constraint you're vi a constraint that you're violating when you propose a point that you would think that you think might be in the feasible set. Okay? So that's the story of ellipsoid as far as I want to go in it. There's a, uh, there are several very um, important books. Um, there's one by um, Gretchen Lovash and Scriver. Um, um, uh, which goes into as much detail on the interior on ellipsoid and various other LP algorithms as you would like. What was that? You know, I can't remember. I just always it's everybody just call, always calls it GLS. Okay. All right. So ellipsoid is great, and it showed that linear programming could be solved in polynomial time, but that polynomial is about n to the six. Uh, and again, and there are all of these sort of technical challenges about, you know, it's, it's really a bizarre way to find a feasible point in a polytope is by shrinking ellipsoid. So if you actually try and implement it, you run into all sorts of challenges. So for, there was a long time when interior point was theoretically polynomial, but everybody just used the simplex algorithm when they actually had to solve a linear program. But there was a breakthrough in 1984 uh, by a guy named Karmakar. Uh, who was at AT&T uh, Laboratories at the time. And um, he had sort of, it was sort of this new perspective on how one solves linear programs. Um, and they go into the general um, label of interior point methods. So let's explain what's meant by interior points. Um, if you think about simplex, the thing that actually makes it feel really complicated um, is the fact that you're moving along the edges of the polytope, right? So you, you take all of these turn, twists and turns as you go. You follow this edge, you hit a corner, you have to go off in another direction, you hit a corner, you go off in another direction. The, the boundary of the polytope is very complicated with all of these faces and edges. 
So what was Karmakar's idea for attacking um, uh, linear programming? Well, he said, let's stay away from the boundary. Let's stay on the inside, right? The inside of the polytope has nice, clean structure. You can go in any direction that you want, right? As long as you stay on the inside of the polytope, there's always a ball around you. Um, and so how can we, how, how can we um, use that in order to um, uh, solve LP? Um, and he, he had another insight, uh, which I'll also mention here, um, uh, which is called uh, primal dual. We've seen already that there is, I mean, we've seen strong duality, which says that the values of the two LPs are the same. But we've also seen these interesting relationships emerging between the primal and the dual, like the fact that when you're doing simplex and you're at an optimum, there's a dual solution staring at you that sort of tells you about your being at the optimum. Uh, we have this notion of duality gap that tells you how far away you are from the optimum and given a primal feasible solution and a dual feasible solution. So the idea behind primal dual is that the, you use the current dual uh, to help you uh, improve the primal. Uh, and vice versa. So you know, from a theory perspective, we had this trick of combine the primal and the dual. And now you have an LP where um, you, know, you just need, you need to do feasibility. But in practice, and now in theory as well, there's this other concept of I'm just going to be, I'm, going to, I'm not going to combine them into a single LP, but I am going to work on simultaneously solving the primal linear program and the dual linear program. And my current state in each of them is going to help me make progress on solving both of them. Does that make sense? OK. So. Um, we're going to use these. We're going to use this inter, these sort of interior point methods and be guided by the primal and dual solutions. Um, Karmakar came up with the first one uh, in 1984, and there was tremendous media hype about it. I think I mentioned last time that there were all these newspaper articles about how now we were going to be able to solve the traveling salesman problem. Uh, uh, it's just not true at all, um, uh, and f it, for a long time they stayed sort of the interesting theoretical curiosities, but. At this point, um, interior point methods have evolved to the point where they are competitive with uh, simplex. And there are certain classes of problems on which interior point is superior and other classes on which simplex is superior. And so if you get like the major LP solvers like Cplex come with both solvers built in and you can choose which one to try using for your LP. Yeah? Experimentally or superior? Experimentally. Experimentally. I mean, what I'm also going to show you um, is that, uh, and you know, sort of the theoretical breakthrough, the thing that made all the buzz was that he gave a polynomial time algorithm. So this has theoretical bounds, but that, this theory has fed really wonderfully into practice and, and produced algorithms that work really well in practice. Okay? Um, now, I've, I've heard some uh, say that actually Karmakar wasn't the inventor. Uh, or, or, I mean, not that he stole it from somebody else, but that this was known under another name um, or under a different, from a different perspective um, uh, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, there were these Russians who worked on things called barrier methods. But I'm not enough of a historian of science to, to be able to really pin down. Uh, where it all came from, and the visibility that was generated by Karmakar's result led to a lot of the progress that we've seen since. OK, so what's the idea? Um, so most of these algorithms, uh, most of these interior point algorithms, um, take a potential reduction perspective. What they say is dealing with constraints is really painful. Right? It, 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 we've, we've seen how hard it is. You know, we had such an easy time solving a linear system, but as soon as we added constraints and inequalities, everything got really complicated. So let's try and get rid of those constraints. So we are going to define a potential uh, that measures um, how close we are to violating a constraint. And we will just add that potential to the, to the objective function. Okay. So 
if we start violating constraints, our potential, our potential is going to shoot up high, and, and that's going to keep us from having a small value. So the only way to minimize the sum is going to be to minimize the objective while obeying all of the constraints. Because if we, get, if we violate them or get even close to violating them, then the uh, large potential is going to dominate the value of the objective that we want to minimize. Okay. So that's the general idea. Yes? Going to like almost violate something. Yes, it's going to almost. And so you play this balancing game, right? Where you sort of you 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 balance the two terms so that the objective function is pulling harder than the potential is pushing away, but not so much harder that it pulls you through the uh, the, the barriers. Uh, this will become clear as we work on the details. Um, but um, so 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 what's nice about this is that once we put everything in the potential, we don't have to worry about constraints anymore. So we're just going to have this really complicated function, and we're going to want to minimize it. Okay. How do you minimize an unconstrained function? Yeah? Take yeah, gradient descent, right? And we're done, right? All we have to do is gradient descent, and uh, we get our answer. Much simpler than talking about all of these constraints and things that you have to worry about. Um, of course, when we start doing the details, a lot, of the, a lot of the complication comes back. But conceptually, the idea of just pushing all of your constraints into the objective function is very appealing. Okay. So now let me start um, uh, filling in some details. So there are many different potential functions that have been used. Um, uh, for, for, for many different algorithms. Uh, the particular one that we're going to use is called the primal uh, log barrier function. Um, G. And it's going to be, it's going to use a sort of a power parameter mu for the reason that we just discussed, um, which is equal to the objective function minus mu times the sum uh, of the logs of all of the variables. Okay. So why is this a good potential function to use? Well, if we, if we minimize g sub mu, then clearly you know, we're trying to minimize cx. But what does this term? cause to happen. Yeah? Exactly, right? So when xj is 1, this is contributing nothing. But then as xj drops below 1 and starts heading towards 0, um, minus mu log xj blows up to positive infinity. And so your potential function blows up to positive infinity. So your potential function is going to not be minimized at any xj equal to 0. Instead, this, you can see this as kind of forcing all of the xj's to stay away from 0. So if you start in the positive orthant, right, and you follow, you do gradient descent on this, on this potential function, this is going to steer you away when you get too close to the boundaries. But it doesn't, you don't run into them and have to change directions. Instead, you get this kind of gentle, uh, this gentle push uh, to, to change directions. Yes? Ah, but so this is exactly the question that was raised before, right? That in fact, um, as we saw in simplex, right, most of the xj's are going to be tight, right? Or there, there are going to be zero. So in a sense, introducing this potential prevents you from actually reaching the optimum, right? However, um, so, so let, me, let me catch up on the writing, right? The, um, the second term uh, explodes as xi goes to 0. Um, uh, so you won't hit any, uh, you won't hit uh, the boundaries. during gradient descent. 
oh, so I didn't state, but we probably all assumed together, I'm looking at a standard form linear program, right? AX equals B, X greater than or equal to zero. So all of my constraints are here in this log of XJ term, okay? Ah, so this is the next sort of uh, elaboration on the story is that we are going to do gradient descent inside the AX equals B uh, subspace. This is still an unconstrained problem from the sense of that entire subspace. We don't have any boundaries to run into, okay? But we'll get there. Okay, so um, this guarantees that we won't hit the boundaries during the gradient descent, um, but um, if mu is very small, uh, then we can get close. So if we have a very small mu um, and we've optimized this potential function, then we know that we're very close. To, it's, it's okay for us to be very close to various xi is equal to zero and that the objective function will dominate in the um, in the location of the minimum. That is, the, the, the minimum of the potential function will be very close to the um, minimum of the objective function uh, as mu goes towards zero, right? And, and so uh, actually, I should have started by saying that, right? In the limit as mu goes to zero, the optimum is going to become the optimum of the linear program. Yeah? Actual optimum, do you like, take the instead of the closest constraints or something and like, Actually, we again use the argument that I just made about the LP, right? So if you're close enough, uh, to the optimum, you can round to it. So remember, we um, gave a procedure for taking a current feasible point and finding a vertex of no worse value. Right? We use that in order to prove that a vertex is an extreme point is a basic feasible solution. Right? So in particular, if you find a feasible point whose value is better than the second best vertex, then when you round, you'll have to go to the optimum. Right? So find a feasible point better than the second best vertex. And then the rounding procedure will um, take you where you want to go. Now you might worry, is there any room between the best and second best vertices? Maybe they are arbitrarily close in value. Can that happen? Can you give me some bound on the gap between the best and second best vertices that can help me uh, know how close I need to get before rounding? I'm asking this because I said the same, I already explained, I said it a couple of boards ago. Right? This is again relying on the precision of linear programming, right? That vertices only are at the, uh, the vertices only have a certain number of bits. So, right, the second best vertex it has different bits than the best vertex, and so the difference in their values. Um, th they have to differ uh, by at least 2 to the minus L if we use the same notion of L for the precision of our numbers. So if we get within 2 to the minus L, um, uh, then we know that there's no other point that we could end up rounding to by mistake. Okay. So we have to get within 2 to the minus L of the optimum solution. This, of course, is going to make us be weakly polynomial again, right? We're going to have a running time that depends on the, the precision of the output. Um, so the strongly polynomial question is not resolved. Um, OK, so um, the, the early methods uh, for doing this uh, just uh, picked uh, a tiny mu to start with um, and did uh, gradient descent using this tiny mu. Um, and that can be made to work, but it's quite complicated to explain. Um, 
and I know because I have tried to explain it in the past. Um, and actually, so the news for you is I, this, we, this year I've decided to adopt a completely different way of explaining interior points, so you get to see it for the first time. So there's probably at least one horrible mistake in what I'm about to show you. Um, on the other hand, I think overall it's much clearer, um, and, and it is sort of the more modern perspective on interior point, uh, uh, and, which I, and I think the, the better one to uh, learn. Um, so now um, people talk about uh, cent the central path. So the idea is to define algorithms that follow this very special path through the polytope. So for each mu, uh, there exists a point x minimizing g sub mu of x, right? And so as you vary, and it's a point in the polytope. And um, as you vary mu, there's obviously some continuity properties here. Um, this set of points trace out a path, which is called the central path. Okay. And the central path starts with uh, when mu is equal to infinity and you're completely ignoring the objective function and just trying to avoid all of the constraints. And that's at a place called the analytic center of the polytope. And it ends um, at mu equals 0, where you're paying no attention at all to the uh, constraints, um, at the optimum. of the linear program. And along that entire path, you're moving through the feasible space of the polytope. Okay? So modern algorithms have a variety of different ways. So again, they define various different potential functions. And for a given potential function, you'll have a different central path. But we're going to talk about the central path for this potential function. And even with this uh, single potential function and single central path, there are a variety of algorithms that you can use, but they all are notionally just working their way along the central path. If we weren't, if we weren't concerned about runtime or finiteness, right, we, you, there's sort of a continuous version of this problem, right, where, where at each step you take the tangent to the central path and you move in that direction infinitesimally. And if you just keep moving infinitesimally along the tangent to the central path, then eventually after infinite time you'll get to the optimum. But we want finite. Uh, a finite solution, right? So um, we're going to have to discretize. Um, a traversal of the central path. Okay. Um, so in order to do that, let me first characterize the, the points on the path. So if I give you an x, how do we know if that point x is on the central path? OK? So let's consider uh, a point x which minimizes g sub mu of x. What can we say about that point? How do we verify that it is the minimum? Well, what's our normal sort of calculus way of verify, of saying something is the minimum? All right, we've got this continuous function. We want to say that we're at the minimum possible value of the continuous function. Yeah? We take the gradient, right? So um, we have this idea. We want to say that um, grad sub g of x is equal to 0. But this is not quite true. Why is it not quite true? Uh, because we are constrained by ax equals b. 
right, the set of uh, the, the, the set of, type of uh, linear constraints in our standard form linear program, right? So maybe the gradient is not zero, right? Maybe, maybe there's a non-zero gradient, but we're still at the minimum because the, the, the gradient, want, the, the actual minimum is off of our ax equals b space. So what weaker condition can we assert must hold if at least within this ax equals b subspace we're at the minimum? Yeah? So the dot product of many vectors within the... Exactly. So the uh, refined idea is that if we're at the minimum, um, that's going to imply that the gradient is perpendicular to ax equals b, right? So the gradient tells us, yes, sure, there's a direction that you can go to improve this objective function, but ha ha, you can't actually go there, right? Um, now, it's also worth writing down the form of the, uh, of the gradient, right? This is equal to, well, we've got a C, per, uh, the gradient of C dot X is just C. And what do we get out of the uh, second term? Well, for each, in each coordinate, right, we have a 1 over Xi in that coordinate. So the gradient is basically this vector of values Ci minus mu over Xi. And that vector of values needs to be perpendicular to the constraints Ax equals b. Okay. But what does that mean? I mean it, it, another way to say that it's per, if it's perpendicular to the constraints Ax equals b, all that is saying is that it is a linear combination uh, of, the, uh, of the rows of A. Right? Because the rows of A are the normals to the, uh, to the constraint uh, hyperspace. Right? So they, they provide all of the possible perpendicular directions to the constraints. And so the only way that we can be perpendicular to the feasible space is if we are a combination of all of those perpendiculars. Yes? OK. But how do we say, is a linear combination of the rows of A in math? What does it say algebraically? How do you, how, what do you need to do to create a linear combination of the rows of, of A? Yeah? Take like X or Y A for some vector. Exactly. So what we can say is that uh, this vector, Ci minus mu over Xi, is equal to Y A for some y, right? So now what should I do? Well, let's write uh, si equal mu over xi. Okay. And now I can conclude that um, ya plus s is equal to c. How do we say that in English? Back and forth between the math and the English. We've seen this formula before. Yeah? The y is bigger than or equal to c. Uh, or, or less than or equal to c, right? Because these are all, the x's are all positive, which means the s's are all positive. Right, so ya is less than or equal to c, which means it's dual feasible, right? So I guess I'll put this up for, for recollection, right? We have this ax equals b x greater than or equal to 0. That's what we're trying to solve. And we have this dual ya less than or equal to c, right? So 
we have a dual feasible solution. Okay. And again, this is just like simplex, right? The fact that we're, that we're stuck on something, right, that we're at the minimum in this case, a, a dual solution kind of pops right out. And so this is sort of an interesting contrast to what you're seeing in your homework this week, right? So in the homework, one of your problems is to say that knowing the dual doesn't help you find the primal in general. But knowing the dual in a particular form or that has arisen in a particular way makes it very easy to find a corresponding primal. Okay. Um, okay, so we have this dual feasible solution. Um, we can also say now that, now that we have a dual, now that we have primal and dual feasible solutions, um, remember we can also say that duality gap um, uh, Cx minus Yb, right? This is the value of the primal problem. This is the value of the dual problem. The optimum is somewhere in between. So this actually tells us how far away we are from optimum, right? Well, Cx is um, uh, Ya plus S times X minus Y times Ax is therefore equal to S times X. Now, what is s times x? Almost. It's, 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 you definitely got the right idea, but the, the math doesn't quite work out that way. si is equal to mu times xi, right? So sx is a dot product over all of the si's. So this is n times mu, right? So mu the sort of the, the, position, the mu on the central path is essentially a m measuring out our duality gap, right? And as we move down the central path, making mu smaller and smaller, yes, we are getting closer and closer to the optimum, and this shows the measure in which we're doing so. Okay. Now, what's also very nice is that uh, this analysis that I've just done is an if and only if, right? So I started this analysis by saying, suppose that we're on the central path, and I kind of concluded all of this stuff. But you can run it backwards. Okay. Um, if all the si, xi are equal to mu, then you are on the central path. Um, so it's, it's an if and only if condition. Okay, and, and we're going to use that. Okay. Everybody happy so far? Do we have this sort of characterization of the central path and how we move along it? Yes? So is the reason taking small u uh, just from the start, the reason is, does the reason that work that because you're starting with a small duality gap that you're allowing in the first place? Uh, well, no. So if you pick a tiny mu at the beginning and you just do gradient descent, then you're not necessarily following the central path. Right, you're, you're just, for a specific mu, you get some potential function which has a minimum somewhere. And if you just fix mu and try to minimize that function, you will move towards the optimum, but you're not, you're not ch chasing different values of mu and, and moving along the central path. You're just going towards the, the bottom of the, the, the end of the central path, possibly by some other route. Okay, so remember, the central path is defined by variation in mu. So we have this polytope, right, and a minimization problem. Um, our central path is going to do some kind of cur crazy curvy thing, staying away from all of the, um, the boundaries. And if I try and follow, I mean, I can start here and then try and follow the central path, and that'll take me this way. But I can also just say, forget about the central path, uh, and actually this came first. I'm just going to set mu to be tiny. So I have a potential function, um, which is very small here. I'm going to start here. I'm going to do gradient descent to minimize the potential function. So the gradient descent to minimize that particular potential function might take me a completely different way. Okay. But the, the algorithm that I'm going to show you is actually going to carefully follow the central path. Okay. Um, and how is it going to do that? Well, we're going to use uh, an algorithm that falls into the class called predictor-corrector algorithms.
So we're at a certain point on the central path for a certain value mu. And we want to get to another point uh, which has a smaller value of mu. What we're going to do is we're going to compute the tangent line to the central path. And we are going to use the fact that we we're going to use our understanding of linear approximation. So we're going to take that tangent line and we're going to go out on the tangent line. Okay. And we're going to argue that, well, our linear approximation is a good linear approximation. And so as we go out on this tangent line, and which is predicting a decrease in mu, right? Um, you know, we, we will see a decrease in mu over here. And we'll also be very still, we'll still be very close to the um, true central path. So after we've taken this predictor step, which sort of improves our mu in a linear approximation sense, but takes us off the central path, then we can take a corrector step, which takes us back to the central path. Okay. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the predictor step, which is uh, more, more challenging um, and, and surprising. Um, for this part, you really are just going to use standard gradient descent. What makes it easy to analyze is that you start out very close to the um, optimum. Okay, so, so you can argue that you, that you get there uh, relatively quickly. Okay. So that's the, that's the picture of what we're going to do. Any questions before we start diving into the, uh, into the math? Yes? Um, I believe that the central path is a path. I think, uh, well, you may be able to make degenerate cases where there's a bunch of solutions, but um, certainly we're going to trace out a path. Um, we're, we're not going to introduce any ambiguity about where we should go. OK, so how do we do the predictor step? Uh, actually, before we get to that, let's just talk about terminating. So we're going to improve uh, mu each time. And when mu is small, uh, we're going to declare victory. Right? Now, I already said uh, on one of these boards that mu small, in this case, means mu like 2 to the minus l, right? So once we're able to drive the duality gap down to 2 to the minus l, then we can round and be done. Yeah? How can you be sure about the taking the path when it gets you to a different branch of the path? Um, right. Well, no. So, uh, I, so what you can be sure of is, taking, is that taking the tangent of the path takes you to a, small value, a smaller value of mu. Okay. Right? And that's what's critical. And then as long as you can go back to a place on the path that has about that value of mu, uh, you're happy. If you jump, I, I don't even know if it's possible to jump to, an, if there is another part of the path that you can jump to, but as long as that value of mu is, is going down, the, uh, that detail doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so when mu is small, you have victory. Um, there's the usual details to worry about, like um, uh, you need a starting mu. So this is about following the central path, so you need to start on the central path. How do you do that? Well, this is very similar to what you're doing on your homework this week. Right? On this homework, you need to find a starting point for simplex. And you do this by, by creating a different linear program that will help you find a starting point for the linear program you actually want to solve. Well, similarly here, you can create a different linear program that allows you to find a place on the central path. Yes? So I'm not really sure what you mean by go to a place that has a small mu, because mu is just the Right. So again, uh, I mean, intuitively what I'm saying is go to a place close to a smaller mu on the central path. But when I do the math, this will all become very concrete. Yes? Uh, there is a unique path because the barrier function is strictly convex. Oh, thank you. OK. That, that keeps it simple. All right. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so, so you can use this trick, again, just like the trick we use for simplex or uh, and relying on some of the same ideas as, um, as for ellipsoid. You can arrange with a mu equal 2 to the L or so that you have to find a starting point with uh, that large, it's a huge duality gap, 
right? Um, it's bigger than any possible value of the primal and dual solutions. Um, but you can find that, and you then proceed from mu equals 2 to the L down to mu equals 2 to the minus L. So in order to understand um, how long this takes us, we have to ask what sort of improvement we can achieve in mu in each of our steps. Okay. So um, that's the question we're going to ask is like, what is the improvement direction? And this is where we start diving into the math. So from the current um, x and s and mu, we are going to want to update our position to uh, a small x plus dx, a small x plus ds, and a small mu plus d mu. Yes? And the question is what sort of constraints we need to um, obey, right? We still want to be on the central path. So what we want is for x plus dx times s plus ds uh, equal to mu plus d mu, uh, sorry, xi plus dxi. So this is, uh, again, the characterization that we got for the central path doesn't talk about uh, derivatives anymore. It just says that all the xi, si products have the same value mu, right? That, that's what gives us a point on the, on the central path. So if we can arrange for our xi plus dxi uh, and times si plus dsi products to all have the same value mu plus d mu, then we know that we're still on the central path. But, of course, this is hard, and so we're going to give up on exactness, and we're going to just try and achieve this to first order. So if I expand this out, I have an xi uh, si plus uh, si dxi plus xi dsi um, plus the low order terms, right? Um, uh, and this should be equal to mu plus d mu. But of course, xi si is equal to mu. So what we're actually going to aim for is having si dxi plus xi dsi equal to the same value d mu for all the different indices i. Okay. And so this is a linear approximation to what we want to have happen uh, as we move along the central path. Okay. But there's some other constraints on legitimate x's, dxi, dx's and ds's to you. So what other, what other criteria do the dx and ds have to obey? Because remember, we're moving from x. We're moving in the dx direction. So what had better be true about dx? Yeah? We have to stay feasible. Right, so x plus dx had better also live on the ax equals b hyperplane, right? So uh, we also need um, a times x plus dx uh, equals b, or uh, in other words, since ax is equal to b, uh, we need a dx equals zero, right? In other words, our, our direction of movement has to be inside of our feasible space. Um, and we also need dual feasibility. We, right, S has to keep, keep us feasible in the dual uh, direction. So we need uh, dy times a plus ds uh, equal to 0 so that they can continue, so that um, we can continue to have ya plus s equal to c. Right? OK. Um, I always get worried when I start typing into math, so make sure and ask questions if any of the steps aren't clear. Um, so you'll notice that we now just have a linear system, right? These are some matrix equations, and this is a set of n uh, linear uh, equalities, right? Because remember that s and x are fixed, so this is actually a linear system in dx and ds for a current x and s. Yeah? How do you choose dy? Ah, so th this is a linear system, right? It just says find ds, dx, and dy such that all of these constraints, and, and d mu, such that all of these constraints are obeyed. Right, so you're, ch you're choosing them all together. 
right? They're, they're all just variables of the linear system. Now, in fact, we're not going to do anything with dy. We don't care what its value is. But the, the point is that this is the linear system that we solve. And it includes these variables that we don't care about. OK? But now there should be an obvious question. I just said, solve this linear system. What's the question? Uh, there is, this is a linear system. There is no objective. What's the obvious question? Does it have a solution? How do we know that there's a solution to this linear system? Unfortunate time for me to have to shift boards, but such is life. So fortunately, the answer is yes. Um, so I'm going to rescale my problem. And this is a technique. It shows up in all of the linear programming algorithms. And I don't have a deep enough understanding to really understand what's going on. I just know that it works. But there is something deep here. Um, this is a technique called affine scaling, uh, which you see in almost all of the interior point algorithms. Um, uh, I'm going to set all of the xi to be equal to 1. Can I do that? Well, if it's, it's, that's just a change of coordinates, right? I have this linear program, ax equals b, um, x greater than or equal to 0. I can transform, if I scale up the x's and scale down the a matrix by the same amount, then I end up with the same linear, uh, same linear program, right? So I can assume without loss of generality that my current solution has all the x's equal to 1. Uh, that, of course, means that all of the si's are going to be equal to mu. Uh, because we're on this mu point of the central path. Um, and so now I can rewrite the equations that I wrote on the other board. Uh, they now say that, um, so the first one that said xi, right? So what we have here now is that si, uh, sorry, that, that, that si is mu and xi is 1. So we have mu dxi plus dsi has to be equal to d mu. Um, so that just means that mu dx plus s um, is equal to the all ones vector times mu. Okay. Um, and then we have still, uh, because this isn't changed by scaling, that a dx equals 0 and dy times a uh, plus ds is equal to 0. Uh, sorry, plus ds is equal to. So this isn't a, a simple problem in disguise, right? Because notice that um, here we have our dx. Oh, sorry, this is a ds, not an s. So here we have our dx, and here we have our, our ds. So we're basically taking this uh, vector, mu dx plus ds, and we're splitting it up into two parts, right? It's dx part and it's ds part. And as we saw before, this says that um, dx is inside of a. Right? This says that ds is perpendicular to a. Right? That's what we saw when we were analyzing the characteristics of our, of our uh, central path. So what we're saying is find a vector that's the all ones vector and break it up into a part that is inside of A and a part that is perpendicular to A. Can I do that? I see nodding heads. What, what's it called? This is a projection, right? So this is basically saying project uh, the, one sub mu vec the 1 times mu vector um, or, or, or decompose it uh, into uh, the a and the a and the, the parts of it that are perpendicular and parallel to uh, the matrix, the, ve the vectors in a. Okay, so there's no th th there's no mystery about whether there is a solution, right? Obviously, you can take the all ones vector and project it. That gives you your dx and your ds that satisfy these equations. Yes. Um, why is it one times mu? And ah, that comes back over here where we put down, remember that these are n linear constraints, one for each i. 
And what's interesting about them is that they say all of the first order terms have to be equal to each other. They all have to equal this quantity d mu. So I've just taken these n different constraints and written them as a vector. Right? So on the left hand side, I have the vector of uh, mu dx plus, uh, uh, plus ds. Right? Uh, and on the right hand side, for each coordinate of the vector, I have the value d mu. So I can basically think of this as the all ones vector multiplied by this quantity d mu. Okay, so I, I can write it out like this. So here I have s1, uh, sorry, the s's are mu's. So mu dx1, let's do the two dimensional version, um, uh, plus ds1 and mu dx2 uh, plus ds2 is equal to d mu and d mu, right? I've, I've combined two constraints into a, into a two dimensional vector. But now, right, these are just the first and second component of mu dx plus ds, and this side is d mu times 1 comma 1. Um, oh, is that what you were asking about? I'm sorry. d mu. Okay. All right. So we can now find the direction that seems to be good for us in that it keeps x feasible, it keeps s, it keeps s dual feasible, and it, it, to first order, it's changing all of the duality gap, all of the xi, si by the same amount, right? So it's, to first order, it is preserving our being on the central path by having all of the, of the mu's be the, all, all the uh, pairwise uh, products be the same. Yes? All right. Um, notice that what we've done over here, uh, we really did find directions. dx and ds are directions. We can rescale them however we like, and it still satisfies this, uh, uh, right? We, we still have this, this orthogonal, that, they're orthogonal to, that there's this orthogonal uh, decomposition. Um, obviously, when we rescale dx and ds, we also rescale d mu. Um, and so now, now that we have this direction, we're going to move in this direction. Uh, until the first order approximation breaks. So there's some distance over, with, over which um, this uh, is a good approximation to the change in the product. We'll move that far. Okay? And because the first order approximation is good in the area that we're moving, um, then the, uh, the actual improvement um, in the duality gap uh, will be close to the first order approximation. Right? And so this is the sense in which we're improving mu, right? We are improving, it, we are improving the duality gap as we change x and mu, x and s. Um, as we do so, we may slightly fall off of the central path. So then we take a corrector step that brings us back to the central path, but with the same duality gap. OK, so the only real question is, to, to, still to answer, is how far can we move this dx and ds? Okay. Um, until our first order approximation breaks. So let's again simplify. Um, because dx and ds are just directions, um, I'm going to rescale uh, my dxi's and dsi's um, uh, such that uh, the sort of total distance that's predicted, the, the quantity d mu that they're decomposing, um, is equal to mu. Okay. In other words, um, 
I, I sort of set my scale up there so that you know, if I move um, this in, in these directions, dxi and dsi, my linear approximation uh, predicts a decrease by uh, mu uh, in the um, individual products xi, si. Okay. Um, so, um, in, in other words, if we, if we use this, um, so what that's saying is that if we, that uh, x plus dxi times s plus dsi is predicted to change by mu. Of course, that's just the first order prediction. It's not actually what's going to happen because the second order term is going to, um, uh, is going to come into play. Um, but if this, if this were true, then um, xs is predicted to drop from uh, n times mu to 0. If each of the terms is decreasing by mu and there's n terms, then again, in the, in the prediction of the linear approximation, um, mu is the distance that we would travel in order to decrease the value to 0. So now what I'm going to ask is, what fraction of that distance can we travel and still preserve the first order approximation? And if I tell you what fraction of the distance we're traveling, I will also be able to tell you what fraction of the improvement we get in the duality gap. Right? So um, now what I'm going to, to figure out is I'm going to really move uh, distance theta dxi, or theta dx, and theta ds. And so I'm going to improve uh, the predicted duality gap uh, to 1 minus theta times mu, uh, sorry, times n mu. So I know this, is, this math is, get, is piling up. And so I, I would love to take questions if there are any. But otherwise, I'll just have to keep going and uh, hope that somebody is following. Um, OK. So um, uh, again, this was just a scaling to talk about the amount. Because what we really want to know in the end is how much do we improve mu. And so I scaled things so that we can talk about how much we improve mu by looking at how far in this direction we're allowed to move and still have our linear approximation be accurate. Okay. Um, so, right, so where does our approximation break? Well, if we go back to our expansion over here uh, or, of, of this product, what's the term that we ignored? dx ds, right, or dxi dsi. So the error dxi dsi is the, is the amount by which our, our approximation is going off. So, um, uh, so as long as this is much smaller than xi dsi uh, plus si dxi, then we're going to be happy, right? In other words, this is our predicted change by, according to our linear approximation. And so as long as the predicted change is much bigger than the error term, then throwing in the error term only takes us a little bit away from the predicted change. And so we can assert that what we're basically saying is that we're still close to the central path because every, every one of the excess products is still going to be pretty close to being the same as all of the other ones, even if it's not exactly the same. Okay. So this is what we need. Um, ah, but we're, doing, we're moving by theta. So we're going to have thetas here. right? So it's theta dsi times xi, theta dxi uh, times si over here, and here a theta squared times dxi dsi. So what that's telling us is that actually theta needs to be much, much smaller than uh, xi over dxi plus si over dsi. Okay. Um, 
But remember that we started by scaling x and mu. Uh, this is just equal to 1 over dxi plus mu over dsi. So if we pick a theta that satisfies this constraint, we'll be OK with our linear approximation. So now we're in the home stretch. So in order to decide what theta can be, we need to ask, right? We want, we want to make theta big. What's going to stop us from making theta big um, is large values for dxi and dsi, right? So how big can dxi and dsi be? Well, where did dxi and dsi come from? How did we construct them? Yeah? We took a projection, right? And this is actually all that we're going to use, right? If you take a projection, you can't get a vector that's longer than you started with, right? So remember that, um, let's see, where did I go? Right. Um, recall that uh, if, we, let's see, if we look at those equations up there, right? We said that 1 sub mu can be written as mu dx plus ds. Those are two parts of the projection. So that mu dx is a projection of 1 times d mu, right? Oh, sorry, of 1 times mu, um, right? Uh, that is, we, we set the length of things uh, to, to, make, uh, to make this all vec this vector of all mu's, and then we projected it in order to get dx and uh, ds. But if mu dx is a projection of uh, 1 sub mu, that means that the length of mu dx, um, sorry? Well, we, set d mu. we set d mu over here to be equal to mu. Right, because we want, because we want to, we're we're scaling things to trying to get rid of all of the duality gap. So um, mu dx uh, therefore has length uh, less than or equal to the length of uh, mu d of one one times mu. Now, what's the length of that vector? The vector of all ones multiplied by mu. So we have an n-dimensional vector of all ones. What's its length? Square root of n, right? So mu dx has length at most mu times the square root of n. But that implies certainly that each xi has to have absolute value less than or equal to mu times the square root of n. In other words, xi can't be arbitrarily big. Using exactly the same argument, we can argue that SI has length less than or equal to square root of n. So if we now go back and look at our requirements on theta, we require that theta be much smaller than uh, 1 over uh, mu square root of n. Uh, Uh, I, I, I may have flipped a mu. Let's see. Uh, oh, thank you. Xi is less than square root of n because of the scaling, right? We said mu dx is a projection of 1 sub mu, so mu dx has length less than mu square root of n, so x itself has length less than root n. Si, on the other hand, has length less than mu square root of n. So, we requ so the, what our requirement turns into a requirement that theta be less than or equal to 1 over root n plus mu over mu square root of n, uh, which is order 1 over square root of n. 
So we are allowed to set theta about 1 over the square root of n and still have our first order approximation be pretty accurate. Okay. Now, if we do so, right, if we set theta equal 1 over the square root of n, how much do we change our duality gap? Well, um, we put in a 1 over, root n over here, one, 1 over root n here, and we find out that the duality gap shrinks by 1 minus 1 over square root of n times, uh, or shrinks to 1 minus 1 over the square root of n times mu. So in particular, uh, root n steps shrink the duality gap uh, to 1 minus 1 over root n to the root n times mu, which is equal to mu over a constant. So root n steps cut the duality gap by a constant factor. Okay. And that implies that order L times square root of n shrink the duality gap to uh, the desired target value of 2 to the minus L. And that's the end of the story. Right? We finish in a polynomial number of steps where the polynomial, again, depends on the dimension of the problem and also on the number of bits required to uh, represent the vertices of the polytope. So it's a weakly polynomial algorithm. Okay. What was that? So what do we need to do in order to take a step? Can somebody sort of read backwards to figure out where the implementation of the algorithm actually happens? Where, in hiding in all of this analysis, there were a few algorithmic steps. What are they? Yes. Uh, scale and project. Scale. scale and project. Right? So the key is solving this linear system. You solve this linear system over and over again. And then you rescale the variables and you solve it again. So it's rescale, solve, rescale, solve. That's all you do. So you're just solving linear systems. Uh, over and over again, and that's the size of the, the linear system you need to solve is its size is determined by the matrix of constraints in the linear program. Okay, um, and of course, you know, there's been decades of work on making linear system solvers incredibly efficient, right? So, you know, that one step is, you know, there's a lot of work on that one step. And I mean, this is a very special case, right? We're just, this is just doing a projection, which is a very special case of linear system solving. So, um, so you're in really good shape for that. Um, now, I described sort of the intuitive thing of take the predictor step and then rush all the way back to the central path. That's not what you do in practice. In practice, you sort of take a big predictor step, and then you just take one corrector step to get close enough to the central path for your next predictor step to be good enough. So you really, in practice, just alternate uh, predictor and corrector steps. And there are all of these heuristics for, I mean, we gave a bound on how far you can go, but that's just a theoretical bound. In practice, you can often go a lot farther before your um, first order approximation uh, falls off. Um, so, so heuristically, you take as long a step as you can to, while, while remaining in the neighborhood of convergence of the central path. And then you correct back towards the central path. And there's lots of rich literature on this and, and lots of ongoing work on how to make interior point algorithms work as efficiently as possible. Um, but the result of all of that has been algorithms that, are, that really do matter in practice. Um, they, they get used a lot. Questions? Yes. Well, so if you want to take the corrector step and you want to actually get onto the back on back. Path, yeah. So you, is it the same deal again where you say you take steps and then you get Yeah, exactly. That's, so that's the point. The corrector step is almost exactly the same as the predictor step here. You're, you're basically solving a, you're solving a linear system that looks a lot like that one, um, but it's actually simpler. I, I forget. I think the DS term disappears or something like that. Um, but um, I mean, it's not surprising, right? In both cases, you're basically looking at a gradient and moving in the direction of the gradient uh, while preserving feasibility. So you just, it's a slightly different uh, 
it, it's just a slightly different objective function that you're taking the gradient of when you want to try and move back towards the central path. So I, I can, there, there's a nice paper, um, the one that I used in order to, to work this out, and I can point people at it who want to go through the algebra more carefully. I mean, the main thing that I'm wondering about is how do you get right constants? Ah, but that's just it. You don't have to. So in practice, um, the, art, it, the, the, way that, the way the analyses work in practice um, is they basically say, if I'm close to the central path, and I do this kind of step, then I will still be close to the central path. Um, or, or rather, if I alternate. So, so each of these steps takes me a little away from the central path, and then the correctors take me back towards the central path. And as long as I am never too far away from the central path, each of the steps works the way that it's supposed to. So I, I'm never actually on the central path. Uh, or, I mean, it, I might be by coincidence, but um, I never really try to get all the way back to the central path because it's overkill. It's better to just uh, be kind of swooping around it as you head towards the uh, optimum. Even the analysis? Yes, yeah, so the analysis, right. So, so the way I described it, I said, we're, I assumed we're, we're starting on the central path, but the analysis says, assume you're in some small ball around the central path, and, uh, and then things work. All right, other questions? All right, so this marks an important dividing line in uh, the class. Uh, so congratulations to all of you who have survived this long. Um, what we've been doing until now is really focusing on combinatorial optimization and polynomial time solvability. So we've gone through you know, shortest data structures, shortest paths, max flows, min cost flows, linear programming. It's all been about solving stuff uh, and what sort of polynomial uh, time bound can you achieve in the standard sequential model of computation. For the rest of the course, we're going to be going at a rate of about once a week, uh, sorry, one per week, uh, through different computational objectives and models. So next week, for example, we're going to be talking about approximation algorithms. So we don't know, so, so there's this whole class of problems that we don't think can be solved in polynomial time but we still have to do something with them when our boss asks us to. So um, we're going, actually, if you, if you go read Gary and Johnson's book on NP completeness, uh, the way they describe it is how you can give your boss an excuse for not having been able to solve the problem. Um, but the, the, nowadays, they don't want excuses. They want solutions. So we are going to look for a week at how one develops approximately, approximately correct solutions to uh, problems that are intractable. After that, we'll look at some other models, computational geometry um, for a week, um, IO, uh, it, sort of um, IO restricted computation uh, for a week, and parallel computation for a week. So, that, so that's, that's what the rest of the, of the semester is going to be like. And so you can sort of take a reset here. We, as we've gone forward and forward on this, the math has gotten more and more hairy. Um, starting next week, we're going to reset back to really thinking in algorithmic terms and hopefully with less math.